Thank you, and welcome to our webinar on applying the USDA Foods Complaint Process, the second in a two-part series. We're glad you're able to join us today, and before our speakers begin, we would like to review a couple features of live meeting. If you look at the top right of your live meeting screen, you will see an icon of three small pieces of paper. If you click this icon, you will be able to download the slide presentation from today's webinar, as well as a certificate providing one continuing education unit for your participation. If you look at the top left of the live meeting screen, you will see a Q&A tab. And this is where you can type in any questions you have for today's speakers. We will answer these questions, as many as we are able to, at the end of the presentation, so you can go ahead and start typing your questions in at any point throughout the webinar. And now we would like to find out a little bit more about our audience and who we have joining us today. Our first polling question is, in which region are you located? Are you in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, Midwest, Mountain Plains, Southwest, or Western region. We will be interspersing several other polling questions throughout the presentation to gather your feedback. And on this first question, it looks like we have participants from all regions of the country joining us today, with the most coming from Western region at 20%, followed closely behind by Southwest and Mountain Plains. And today we have two speakers from the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch who also share their expertise on our first complaints webinar. Andre Orange has over 13 years of experience with the Food Distribution Division, providing technical assistance to regional offices and states regarding USDA foods programs and handling and resolving complaints. Our second speaker, Tony Wilkins, joined the Food Distribution Division in November 2015. He brings over four years of experience working with the North Carolina Department of Agriculture in USDA food distribution, warehouse management, handling complaints, food recalls, and recipient agency grades and contracts. And now we'll turn the webinar over to Andre to begin our presentation today. Thank you, Lindsay. Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. We will recap a few items from our prior webinar, Demystifying the USDA Food, USDA Food Complaint Process. But starting with the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch, Many Responsibilities, which are to resolve complaints or issues with USDA Foods and Department of Defense Fresh Program, the Oversight of National Processing Agreement Program, Allocate and Monitor USDA Entitlement for National School Lunch Program, monitor Department of Defense FRESH program, and monitor and analyze management evaluations. However, today, we're going to continue our focus on USDA foods complaints and applying the process to successfully submit complaints. This slide here, we have our program integrity and monitoring branch complaint team, where we've added names to the faces for you. As indicated here, left to right, we have Denise Branscom, Linda Hubini, David Leggett, Blair Tucker Gushala, Tony Wilkins, Kathy Staley, our branch chief, Karen Laskin, and yours truly, Andre Orange. Goals of the complaint team are to provide responsive customer service to you, our clients. Investigate and resolve complaints or issues, analyze the complaint data by providing guidance and training how to handle USDA foods, improve product specifications, and work with the Agriculture Marketing Service, or AMS, to resolve issues with vendors. Who are our partners on complaints? We work closely with the Food Nutrition Service Office of Food Safety, who in turn works with the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and the Food Safety and Inspection Service, FSIS. As I mentioned previously, we also work with the Agriculture Marketing Service, AMS Procurement. And they contract with the vendors and develop product specifications. In a prior webinar, we discussed the five W's, who, what, when, where and why. 
It was recorded and available now for online viewing, and a link will be provided at the end of today's presentation. Exactly what is a complaint? Complaints consist of quality of product. Examples of that would be product damaged, discolored, moldy, or decayed. Also, foreign material in product. Examples here would be bones, metal, plastic, and bugs. Packaging condition. Examples would be damaged cases, cases coming unglued, or leaking cans. Cooking and preparation issues. Some examples are beans still hard after cooking, beef patties not in a, not in a patty shape, or product caused illness, injury, or allergic reaction. In this case, for example, health issue or injury has occurred. And there are transportation issues. And some examples would be delivery, where a truck arrived with no seal, seal number doesn't match paperwork or shipping report, there's temperature abuse or improper temperature or load has shifted. How to file a complaint? With 32 million National School Lunch Program meals served daily, it can be expected that there may be issues from time to time. The preferred method for filing a complaint is to enter data into the web-based supply chain management system, WBSCM, or web as it's used interchangeably. Some required information to enter the system in web would be a sales order, and after successful completion of entering the complaint, the web system assigns a complaint number. In addition, you may file a complaint through our email that we have provided there on the screen, or our food complaint hotline. Check loading. And for this example, I'm specifically talking about canned and frozen fruit and vegetables. And specifically, what is check loading? Check loading is an, is an inspection by a USDA inspector of the inside and outside of a trailer and the canned and frozen fruit and vegetables to be delivered inside. Who performs the check loading? As indicated, a USDA inspector. In that process, again, for the canned fruit and frozen vegetables, involves a USDA inspector examining the outside of the trailer by doing a walk around, looking for any signs of damage, leaks to the trailer, and for frozen product, the inspector checks temperature reading on the outside of the trailer before trailer doors are open. Once trailer doors are open, the USDA inspector for the frozen product uses a long stem thermometer to check the temperature of the product by placing a the thermometer between the cases of product, not in the actual product itself. Inside the trailer, the USDA inspector inspects the products to ensure it meets specifications, pack dates, material code, and quantity against the shipping report of bill of lading. When the inspection is completed, the USDA inspector places a seal on the trailer doors. And you'll see examples in the slides to come. For multiple deliveries, the driver is provided with seals for each drop. The driver is responsible for resealing the trailer before going to subsequent stops. Loads should be rejected if seals do not match the seal number recorded on the bill of lane or shipping report or if the seal is broken or seal is missing. Types of complaints. Almost every complaint is different and has its own story. Today, we will review a few real-life examples. Transportation, trailer door seal not intact, incorrect delivery paperwork or seal numbers do not match number on the bit of late no shipping report, improper temperatures of product 
or load has shifted during transit. With that being said, how do you handle receiving USDA food deliveries? What steps do you take to record the receipt of your delivery? Are you looking for dates, times, temperatures, lot numbers, damaged products? And we do have available resources such as our policy memo, the 709-5, the shipment and receipt of USDA foods for further information. Security seals. As mentioned previously, we have examples here in our slides of two types of seals. The one on the left is what's called a metal braided seal, and the one on the right is our boat seal. The seal numbers should be documented on the bill of lading, which must be signed or acknowledged by the carrier or its agent. Deliveries will be rejected in which seals have not been used to secure all cargo doors. If the seal listed on the bill of lading does not match the seal number recorded on the bill of lading, or if the seal is broken, the seal is missing, or the seal has been removed prior to the transportation reaching its unloading point. What should be documented? Overage insurance, damages, leaks, all on the bill of lading, your copy of the bill of lading, and even in the web-based supply chain management system of the complaint, there is a remarks field where this information can be entered as well. There is a free form field in the system where you can enter the information as far as your damages. Here's an example of how one state documents the arrival and acceptance of USDA loads. Here they have an ink stamp. Notice here the slide is the seal number, load temperatures, pack date, case counts. How do you document the receipt of product? This documents that you are consistently inspecting what you are expecting. If there is a future occurrence, this documentation can be a good reference. In the prior webinar, we offered this example of what will be covered in today's webinar. How do you handle a load of USDA foods that has arrived and part of the load has shifted during transit? And this brings us to our next polling question. If you encounter a situation as demonstrated in the photo when two pallets have shifted, how would you handle that? Would you accept the load as is and restock the shifted pallets would you restack the product, reject the damaged product, and file a complaint on the damaged product? Or would you tell the driver you were refusing delivery and call the USDA to its complaint team? And the slight majority of you have chosen the second option to restack the product and reject the damaged product and file a complaint on it. And the next response with the highest votes was the third one, to tell the driver you were refusing delivery and call the complaint team. Andre, what would you recommend? Each situation is different and has to be evaluated for your circumstances. You need to make some decisions. What the complaint team needs you to do is to report these types of transportation issues, even if you decide to accept the load as is and restack the shifted product. We cannot resolve issues if we don't know about them. Some things or questions to ask regarding this particular load, why no shrink wrap, lack of load support devices, divider airbags, load locks, improper stacking technique, bad pallets, or driver performance. Right. Proper loading. The picture on the right with the arrow demonstrates a proper loading device and it is important that the trailer is properly loaded. In this example here, low security airbags, load bar, lock bars, quality pallets, interlock stacking methods, effective shrink wrapping product, offset loading should be expected best practices of transport from USDA food suppliers. And again, we have resources, the policy memo 709-5, shipping and receipt of USDA foods, 
as a guide. And if after inspecting the load, you notice some of the product has been damaged during transit, or there is a discrepancy in the product quantity of product, you can accept the load, but remember to note on the bill of lading the damaged product and quantity of product received. Then file a complaint in web. Okay, in this example, observe that the product cases are stacked directly on the trailer floor. As you will note at first glance, it seems that the entire load is loaded this way. But in this real-life example, it was discovered that only the last row of product was unpalletized. The state documented on the bill of lading that six cases were stacked on the trailer floor. And more recently, we had a report of an entire load of cereal delivered with no pallets or slip sheets. In this case, the state elected to take receipt of the load as they needed product that day, and, and they had the labor and the time to offload. In that example, they had every right to refuse the entire load. Best practices for receiving USDA foods. Prior to unloading, carefully check the load. Take temperature of frozen and refrigerated foods. Verify the quantity. Examine the quality of the USDA food and condition of packaging and containers. It is important to ensure that the bill of lading indicates the accurate quantity of USDA foods received. Note any damaged product or other problems before signing and dating the delivery receipt and returning it to the vendor or carrier. If product defects are observed after acceptance of the shipment, notify, if your, for your recipient agency, notify your state distributing agency or any tribal organization of the problem. They, in turn, will contact our complaint team and file a complaint in web. Enter the goods received in web within two calendar days of receipt. More best practices for receiving USDA foods. Take photos of any problems observed. Train staff on how to properly inspect and handle deliveries. Is the refrigerated product sitting out for an excessive amount of time before it is properly stored. Again, if a recipient agency, if there is a doubt as to the quality and condition of the USDA foods, contact the respective state distributing agency or any tribal organization. Again, they in turn will research if needed and contact the complaint team. In addition, you may want to keep handy our references to 709 5 and our FD-107 storage and inventory management of USDA foods as a handy tool. Check temperature. Inspect what you expect. Checking the refrigerated trailer temperatures, pulling history tapes, and shooting temperatures with the gun are ways to check these temperatures. Ask the dry delivery driver how they were following up and recording the temperatures. Transportation best practices. Trailer should be pre-cooled for at least one hour before loading to remove heat from the trailer. Pre-cooled with doors closed. And speaking of temperatures, we all know how hot the interior of a parked car gets in the summer and how long it can take to cool it down. Again, that same principle applies here to refrigerated trailers. And so a good practice here is to pre-cool the trailers to avoid any product damage. All right, at this time, I will turn the remainder of our webinar over to my colleague, Tony Wilkins. Thanks, Andre. Moving forward on today's presentation, we're going to be offering six more polling scenarios. So please respond with how you would handle the situation from your perspective or your location. Before we move into the polls, though, I wanted to make sure we covered examination of product quality. Just like in uh, Andre's discussion previously on inspecting the refrigerated load temperatures, we also need to be looking closely at the actual product. The USDA food value of a full truckload could be equal or greater than the value of a new car. I'm sure that you would closely inspect the vehicle 
or the last vehicle that you purchased to make sure it met your expectations. A best practice would be to open up cases and closely look for warning signs like the ones pictured above. Refreezing crystals and bugs inside cellophane wrap are definitely problems. Be sure to randomly check through product in the load, just not just the top corner box. And speaking of frozen loads, our next question for you is, what temperature should a frozen load be? Under 32 degrees Fahrenheit, between 0 and 25 degrees, or 0 degrees Fahrenheit, or colder. And over half of you selected the last option, 0 degrees or colder. Tony, is this the correct answer? The correct answer is temperature at 0 degrees or colder. So, you want to store your frozen foods at 0 degrees Fahrenheit or lower to retain the product quality, color, flavor, and texture. So now, we're going to cover some packaging complaints. Some examples of packaging issues would be cases coming unglued, a bad wrapping seal on cheese product, bags of rice having large holes and product falling out, and possibly even containers leaking. Here we have an actual situation where a full trailer load of canned mixed fruit was being unloaded, and after just removing a few pallets, it was quite obvious there was going to be some issues. Once all the pallets were removed from the trailer, four pallets had a bottom corner can leaking, resulting in the loss of a total of four cases. So, on to our next poll. How would you handle this situation? If you encountered leaking cans as in the photo, would you accept the load and mark the bill letting us four cases damage, discard the damaged product, but not file a complaint or communicate the issue? The second choice, would you accept the load, mark the bill letting us four cases damage, and hold the product as you file a complaint in WebSDM? Would you advise the driver you were going to refuse the entire load or call complaining for directions as you're not sure how to handle this scenario. And about 80% of you chose the second option to go ahead and accept the load, indicate the damaged cases on the bill of lading, but hold the product and file a complaint in WebSDN. Well, in this scenario, only by multiple complaints being filed did the national trend become evident. With only a few cases leaking, most of the states elected to receive the full load. However, they were fast faced with the uh, task of unstacking the pallets to remove the leaking case and then restack. This was definitely an aggravating and time-consuming endeavor. After contacting the vendor, they too analyzed the problem and concluded they needed to make a delivery process change. Keep this complaint in mind as we will cover this and other recent complaint results towards the end of today's webinar. In this actual complaint situation, the school found slight interior candy tinning that did not present an objectionable appearance or odor or did not affect the edibility of the product. So, on our next poll, considering the above picture and information, how would you handle this situation? Would you dispose of the three cases without filing complaints? Would you dispose of them but file a complaint in WebSCN? Would you keep serving the product and call the complaint team for direction? Or would you stop serving, hold the product, and file a complaint in WebSDM? And most of you chose the fourth option. About 70% of you said that you would stop serving, hold the product, and file a complaint in WebSDM. Okay. During canning production runs, oxygen is removed by vacuum and is essential to the canning of applesauce and this helps prevent mold and detinning. Slight detinning that does not present an objectionable appearance and that does not affect the edibility of the applesauce should be ignored. Detinning may become so extensive as to affect the color and flavor of the product. Like with so many complaint situations, the decision to serve is made at the local level. In this situation, we only had a few states report and only in small numbers. One state elected to serve the applesauce and another state discarded the equivalent of three cases. Both filed complaints. There may have been more situations, but they 
were not reported and we know have, had no way of knowing if there were more situations like this. As we stated in our prior December webinar, we understand it's a lot of work to file a complaint, so we do appreciate your effort in filing a, a complaint. So now, let's move on to a social media complaint. Well, this is my favorite complaint that we will cover today. I found it really interesting that the school actually monitored Facebook and found this post by a student that was eating lunch at the school. A quick trip by the principal to the school cafeteria found the trash cans filling up with unopened, single-serve boxes of raisins. The students were understandably perceiving that the October 4th stamp date was the expiration date. So on our next polling question, we ask, how would you handle this situation? If you came across these raisins, would you dispose of them without filing a complaint? or dispose of them and file a complaint in WebSCM. Would you keep serving them, check the cases for more information, and also file a complaint in WebSCM? Or would you stop serving and hold the product as you file a complaint in WebSCM? And we greatly appreciate your participation in all of these polls today as we're curious to know how you'd respond. And on this question, also about 70% of you selected the last option to stop serving and hold the product and file a complaint in WebSCM. So, in this real life scenario, the kitchen staff stopped and checked the case in the storage room just to see how it was labeled. The date stamped 10 4 on the individual serve box was stamped on the case as PKD 10 4, which is the pack date. So, at the time, the raisins were good. To avoid the students from trashing the product, the kitchen staff quickly put a sign on the serving line notating the product was in date and it was okay to consume. From only the single complaint, the USDA vendor was advised of the complaint and the vendor was requested to change their labeling practice for the single serve carton. I often wonder how many individual cases were thrown away nationally because of this misperception. Now let's move to product quality complaints. Above are some real life USDA product quality complaints. On the left is what was supposed to be frozen beef patties, and on the right was discolored frozen tubes of ground beef. Product quality may consist of items such as taste, odor, color, and shape. So now let's take a look at uh, a few past product quality complaints. In this actual situation, the school began to notice different product colors all from the same vendor. They felt the product was fine to serve, but they were just puzzled on why this was happening, so they filed a complaint, as they had 1,600 cases remaining in stock throughout the school system. So on our next polling question, how would you handle this? If you saw these cans of applesauce, would you dispose of the four cans without filing a complaint, or as you file a complaint in WebSCM? Next, would you keep serving and monitoring and call the USDA complaint team, or would you stop serving, hold the product, and file a complaint in WebSCM? And once again, most of you did choose the last option to stop serving and hold the product, about 65%, but 25% of you said that you would keep serving and monitor the situation as you call the complaint team. All right, so to understand the product color variations, our team did some research and discovered an issue known as stack burn. Immediately after the filling process, the applesauce cans are sealed and then cooled by water. The temperature of the canned applesauce should then be reduced to around 95 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Temperatures lower than 95 degrees will not permit the tin containers to dry thoroughly, which can contribute to the exterior of the can rusting. Stacking these cans with an internal temperature of higher than 105 may cause the applesauce to continue to cook, or so the term stack burn, resulting in a pinkish or sometimes brown discoloration. Again, every situation is different, so you have to weigh the facts to determine how you, you plan to handle the situation. In this type of situation, we encourage filing a complaint and communicating to us your expectations. In this scenario, the school system elected to continue to use and serve in the product and did so with no fish 
future issues. One state recently reported their USDA whole wheat tortillas, after thawing, smelled like rancid motor oil, which I thought was a very vivid description. As soon as wheat berries are cracked open in whole wheat, as in the milling process, their exposed natural oils begin to oxidize and causes them to eventually become rancid. In about the same amount of time it takes for milk to become sour at room temperature, the natural oils in whole wheat flour can become rancid. The takeaway on this is once you thaw a product, the clock starts ticking. You need to serve the product quickly. In this still open complaint, we are working with our USDA partners, the vendor, and the single state to find a satisfactory resolution. As we move through the process, we've been keeping the state informed. The state continues to hold the remaining unused frozen product in storage. Depending on the vendor and situation, some complaints will take more time than others to resolve. So now we're going to move over to foreign object complaints. Well, seen in this picture, Sometimes our chicken products may have more chicken than we anticipated. Foreign object complaints may consist of items like insect, bone fragment, or even a metal shaving. Once complaints are identified and communicated to us, we track and relay these occurrences to our vendors. These vendors work hard to try to find solutions to avoid future occurrences. They're also working to try to resolve the current situation. When complaints become repetitive, we identify trends and work for solutions and closure. So, once we receive your complaint, we are first going to search our complaint records based on the product item number, and then we're looking for other similar complaints. Your report may be the very first one of a series, so each complaint is very important. In addition, our team meets every morning to discuss open complaints and compare notes on how we are working towards complaint resolution. In the picture above, in this actual occurrence, a student discovered a single worm in his frozen strawberry cup. All, although that state didn't submit a picture, they did file a complaint. After that initial report, we began to see a slight national trend with a specific vendor which we then addressed and worked toward resolution. Each complaint filed helps our team work towards resolving the complaints and issues. So to recap, before a complaint is reporting or filed, it's critically important to collect all the facts that you can, as Andre stated earlier, the who, what, where, when, and why. Again, we're looking for information like, has anybody been injured, become ill, the sales order is definitely a critical piece of information that will be needed to file a complaint in web supply. You can get this information off your bill of lading paperwork when you first receive the shipment of USDA food. Also needed is a lot, case, or can number, as well as any product code or date. We also would like to get the quantity of product in question. For example, we received 800 cases, 152 are leaking. Please also include photos of product labels, which are very helpful, especially to our vendor. They all have different types of codes and numbers attached to them. Photos, clear photos. Here's some actual photos submitted to uh, our USDA complaint team. If you're going to take the time to submit a photo, please make sure they're clear. It's a good practice to use a familiar item like a coin or a ruler to give the object some Indeed, the old saying is true, a picture is worth a thousand words. So I'm sure you're looking at these pictures and wondering, what is that item on the left? Well, supposedly it was a mouse that was found inside a case, not in the product, but in a case. And the one on the right can be easily be identified as a chunk of corn husk which was found in a case of frozen corn. Again, please, 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 keep the item. Do not dispose of it. If it's a refrigerated item, put it in the refrigerator, freezer, same way. You need to keep it just in case the vendor wants to inspect it. Again, additional detailed information is always welcome. 
Please provide a detailed description of the issue. For example, with the cans of um, mixed fruit, it was finally determined it was the bottom layer uh, corner can that was the, normally the leaker. So that was good information that helped us uh, find the solution. Also provide the date that the product was received. Tell us the physical address location of the remaining damaged product. By getting us the who, what, where, when, and why, we'll quickly get the complaint process moving. Lack of information requires us to call back and get the information. Okay. To recap again, Web Supply is the centralized system used to file food complaints. You can also call or email the complaint team with the numbers and uh, email address that Andre provided earlier. Because we understand sometimes you have a situation that requires immediate attention, or we all know how computers work. Sometimes you don't have access or, or to Web Supply. For users who have not used Web Supply or are uncomfortable in using Web Supply, please contact the complaint team. We can help, and we can either enter it in here or. Uh, we can help you become more comfortable in using Web Supply. So what should you expect? You should expect our dedicated team to work with you to resolve complaints and keep you informed of what's happening through the entire process. If only a few states report a complaint, we don't get a complete picture. We can only make assumptions. If complaints trickle in over several months, it can take a long time to establish the root cause. When complaints are reported, it helps us identify these trends, issues with product specifications on our end and or poor inventory management. Best practices would be using your first in, first out FIFO uh, for USDA foods with the date of the product receipt, monitoring inventories and ship out the oldest product first. Manage USDA inventories effectively and do not exceed a six-month supply. Food sitting in storage is not helping anybody. Proper storage conditions and effective inventory management to ensure that the foods are distributed in a timely manner and optimal con condition. And as Andre uh, discussed earlier, the 7095 shipment and receipt of USDA foods and FD107 should always be handy uh, to refer to. Now to our final polling question. What temperature should I store my raisins? Would you store your raisins at room temperature around 70 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit? Would you freeze them until the time of use? Do you think the temperature doesn't matter with raisins? Or would you put them in a cool, dry place? Almost all of you selected the same answer, the last option, to store raisins in a cool, dry place. 89% of you selected this option. Very good. good. Good job. So, to maintain freshness and avoid issues, it's recommended by vendors that raisins be stored in a cool, dry place to achieve a six-month shelf life. If this one caught you by surprise, start thinking about your other USDA food items that are temperature sensitive. A few examples would be brown rice, flour, and rolled oats. On the slide that's currently showing, you'll see a USDA product information sheet. This will help you determine how you are to store your USDA products. You can refer to these specific product information sheets provided by USDA. Uh, they are available online. So I told you later in the webinar we were going to talk about some recent success stories. One state recently received several truckloads of bonus chicken leg quarters, and they found the interior bags were frozen and interlocked together. In that condition, they were unable to safely redistribute the product at pantry locations. The complaint was filed, and the load was re-inspected by USDA at the state level. The inspector rejected the load, and the vendor has been scheduled. Uh, the vendor has scheduled an appointment to pick up and replace the rejected product. Several states had an occurrence with can tops bulging. After reviewing the complaints, the specific vendor has accepted responsibility and will be issuing checks for reimbursement. 
As pictured earlier in the webinar, many states reported a specific vendor having issues with cans leaking. The vendor addressed the complaint with an internal investigation and came up with a new pallet design. This design was set to fully support the case of product during its transport. We are currently monitoring the vendor change to see if these improvements are helping and keeping a running total of product losses. One state recently reported bugs in rice. With a very short, within a short time frame, the vendor addressed the complaint and replaced the load and picked up the rice in question. Since our prior webinar in December, we have seen a dramatic increase in communication and complaints, which is exactly what we want. We are glad to see all the feedback. It will help us be more effective and quickly find these trends and work towards solution and closure. Moving forward, the Program Integrity Monitoring Branch is here to help you and should be your first line of communication to address your USDA food complaints and concerns. With that, I will turn the webinar back over to Lindsay. Thank you, Tony and Andre, for providing all of those excellent examples and best practices. And now we are opening up for questions. As a reminder, you can type in your questions by clicking on the Q&A tab on the top left of your live meeting screen. Also joining us for our Q&A session is Kathy Staley, the Chief of the Program Integrity and Monitoring Branch. Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for joining us um, on our second complaint webinar. So we really appreciate all the questions and feedback that we've been receiving from you. So I'm going to take a few moments to address some questions that we received prior to today's webinar. There were an awful lot of questions about seals on trucks. So here's, here's the information that you've all been looking for. The seal um, is on the truck, but the seal number is not recorded on the bill of lading. What should I do? <clears throat> so here's the requirement. Vendors are responsible for placing a seal on cargo doors after loading um, and partial unloading, inspection, or servicing. Seals must be numbered. The vendor should provide a sufficient number of seals to ensure security of the load to final delivery point. The seal numbers must be documented on the bill of lading, which must be signed by the carrier. Deliveries should be rejected when the seal is listed on the when the seal listed on the bill of lading does not match the seal number on the door. The seal is broken or the seal is missing or the seal has been removed prior to reaching the delivery point. A rejected load should only be accepted after a condition of container inspection has been completed by a USDA inspector. The inspector will seal the door and record the seal number. We've had several recent incidents where a truck has um, shown up at a delivery point. There have been issues. The truck drives around the corner, and the same truck driver with the exact same load in the exact same condition reappears. Remember, the load has to have been re-inspected and have a new seal number, and it will be um, signed for by the USDA inspector. So I hope this helps um, answer all of the questions that you have on seals. As always, the complaint team is available. As Tony mentioned earlier, we also had a question about several loads of cereal that arrived that were stacked directly on the floor of the trailer. How should that be handled? Again, the requirement is all shipments of cereal are required to be slip sheeted only and stretch wrapped, meaning they should have shrink wrap around the, the packages. Um, and the trailer should be blocked and braced or otherwise loaded to prevent shifting during transit. <clears throat> if you're not sure what to do, remember the USDA complaint team is there to help you. So I'm going to pause for a moment and look and see what kind of questions we have coming in. And as we continue to review and answer your questions, I wanted to let you know that on the webinar screen, we are now sharing the evaluation form. So you can send us your feedback on today's webinar and any comments you have. We always appreciate 
your input on how we can improve future webinars and what you found helpful. And also, after the webinar today, I will be emailing out to all the registrants the link to the survey if you want to fill it out at a later time along with the slide presentation and, as Andre mentioned, the YouTube recording of our first webinar in case you want to catch up or review the information presented in December. Okay, Lindsay, um, I see we have a question about, um, I've submitted a complaint. What would be an estimated um, time to receive a response? Well, now that the Program Integrity Monitoring Branch has a dedicated USDA complaint team, um, we have set the goal that you will receive a response from one of the team members um, within 24 to 48 hours. And as Tony mentioned, um, it is also our goal to communicate, communicate, communicate. So not only will you hear from us when you first submit the complaint, you will hear from us all the way through until the complaint has been resolved. So I hope that answers that question. How can we report issues with DOD Fresh? Um, again, that the um, complaint team is here to help you resolve any issues um, with product that you're receiving through um, your USDA entitlement. So if you have an issue with a, um, a DOD vendor um, and you have worked with the DOD service rep um, and the vendor and have not gotten resolution, please contact our complaint team and we will work with you and DOD to resolve that. So there was a question on here about the example on the uh, color change on the applesauce. Uh, the, the Burn stack actually changed the color of it, but it did not make the applesauce go bad. So, but again, at the local level, you're going to be seeing it, smelling it, tasting it. You'll be able to uh, do a better evaluation on what, how you feel about the product. You, know, you always heard the old saying, it would, when in doubt, throw it out. But again, that's going to be a determination you can make on your end. What we're trying to strive for, uh, and impress is please report these occurrences to us because they are important and we will be uh, taking those issues up with the vendor and trying to find solutions so they don't happen. In the um, I see a question here, is there a minimum amount necessary for reimbursement or return? Um, as Andre and um, Tony tried to explain, each case um, is different, but what may start out as a small um, situation where one particular location has received wet, leaky cans after we have um, started reaching out to additional states, we found that it was a nationwide problem. So don't assume you're the only one that has the problem. <clears throat> Again, as Tony and, and Andre mentioned, if, we don't, if you don't tell us about it, we can't fix it. So um, we need to hear about them. Why can't cereal be pallet? Well, that's certainly something that we can talk with the AMS team to um, change the product specification. But right now, the product specification specifically says it will be um, slip sheeted. The question came up, is there a way to add more pictures to a complaint after it has been submitted? The answer is yes. It has to be done outside the system through one of the complaint team members. So contact the complaint team and we we'll provide an email address you can send directly to that designated complaint team member. I hope that answered your question. Um, so if we have a question, what if I'm the only one with the problem? Well, as Tony showed you a real life example of the whole wheat tortilla, that is a, one state is having that issue and we are working to um, resolve. So we will work with you if, if you're the only state who has that problem. Thank you for attending our webinar entitled Applying for USDA Foods Complaint Process. This concludes today's presentation.